Thinking aloud. Conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. Our topic today is alien encounters, hard science, and especially the passion of John Mack. My guest is Ralph Blumenthal, who was a reporter for the New York Times from 1964 to 2009. He has written seven books based on investigative crime reporting and cultural history. His latest book, about which we'll be talking, is called The Believer, Alien Encounters, Hard Science, and the Passion of John Mack. Ralph is based in the New York area, and now I'll switch over to the internet video. Welcome, Ralph. It's a pleasure to be with you today. Thank you, Jeff. Great to be here with you. I'd like to start our discussion by talking about the uh, really significant reporting that you've done recently in the New York Times regarding uh, UFO sightings as, as reported by the Navy. Yeah, well, Leslie and I uh, really broke that story in 2017 uh, when we got wind of uh, the existence of ATIP, this uh, secret Pentagon office uh, that was monitoring uh, UFO contacts with Navy jets and vessels. Um, and uh, that story ran in the New York Times on a Sunday, page one, and it, it really moved the needle, uh, as we're told. Uh, uh, made it safe, basically, for mainstream media uh, to report on this uh, whole subject without the ridicule factor. So um, uh, that was the big story. And we since followed up with a few other stories. Uh, with uh, First of all, we reported the existence of this um, until then secret uh, office, ATIP, um, uh, which really uh, had been underway for some time. Uh, and it showed that when, when the government said it was shutting down UFO operations with Blue Book in 1970, that was not true. Uh, you know, they said, in effect, nothing to see here, folks. <laughs> Just pass by. Uh, but, uh, in fact, they were very interested themselves, the government, the Pentagon. And um, in 2007, uh, as then the Democratic Majority Leader uh, Harry Reid and the Senate uh, got $22 million to set up this office, uh, which had been operating secretly until we broke the story. And uh, now it's been revived. Um, uh, ATIP gave way to uh, the UAP Task Force, Unidentified Aerial Phenomenon Task Force, which uh, is now operating. When we talk about the life and the career of the Harvard psychiatrist John Mack, about whom you've written, these reports that you've made in the last few years, over a decade after his death, really shed a whole new light, I would think, on his career. Well, yeah. I mean, I was able, through papers provided by his family, access to uh, all his archives, his personal journals, his analysis tapes, because as a psychiatrist, he had to be analyzed. And he took it one step further. He recorded the analysis in many cases, so I had access to those tapes. So I got, I think, a real window into his life. Plus, I was able to interview a lot of the people close to him, including his dear wife, Sally, uh, who died of cancer uh, shortly after I interviewed her. Uh, they were estranged, actually, at the end, but they spent 30 years together as, as a married couple. Um, and through thick and thin and through some difficult times with him, she, she stuck with him uh, as a supporter. So um, I was able to talk to her and their sons. So I, I, I did get some good information. Well, I have to say, you've been working on this book 16 years. It's uh, a, a fascinating book because it covers so many elements of cultural history, as well as the mystery of the UFOs and particularly alien abductions. Let's start uh with his exploration of, of T.E. Lawrence, a book for which he won a Pulitzer Prize. 
Yeah, uh, I mean, before John Mack ever got involved in uh, UFOs and alien abduction, uh, he distinguished himself uh, in many other fields. Uh, first of all, in in social causes, uh, he was um, well, he was an eminent psychiatrist at Harvard, a professor of psychiatry, and he also um, was very dedicated to uh, social social betterment, uh, social issues. He uh, brought mental health care to Cambridge, which is then a downtrodden area. Boston, um, and then he got involved in a, a, um, a, a battle against n- nuclear weapons. Uh, he joined protests. He was arrested with his family at the Nevada test site. So he had a whole series of these social causes. And uh, then one night, you know, like all of us of a certain age, he went to the movies to see Lawrence of Arabia. Um, uh, but unlike us, uh, well, we walked out and said, wow, wow, great movie, long but great. He said, uh, I got to, you know, investigate this guy who was Lawrence. So uh, he embarked on what was then a, what was a, tw- a 12 year uh, research project um, uh, into Lawrence's uh, family and his history. And he went to the Middle East. Uh, he got access to uh, Lawrence's closest associates and his family. And he wrote this book called A Prince of Our Disorder that won the Pulitzer Prize in 1977. So uh, this was all before he became involved in, in alien abduction. So it grounded him really um, in, in, in the dis- in intellectual discipline and uh, it gave him a standing when he did go into alien abduction. He brought with him, you know, a really hefty reputation. I'm actually under the impression that your biography of John Mack in some ways parallels, even though I haven't read it yet, his biography of T.E. Lawrence. Well, he uh, he took Lawrence as a kind of a role model, uh, for better or worse. I mean, Lawrence had a lot of uh, psychological issues. Uh, he, um, he was very shy, actually, uh, unlike the portrayal of him in the movie and, and elsewhere. Um, and Mac was always um, riveted by the question of the inner life versus the external life of somebody. And... Um, uh, and of course, Lawrence uh, died in a motorcycle accident, and John Mack would die in a road accident, run down by a drunk driver. So, but he often said that he took um, lessons from Lawrence's life and modeled himself after Lawrence in some ways. So, reading John Mack's book it gives you some insight um, into not only Lawrence but John Mack. And, and your book is, as well, you really look at the inner life versus the outer life of, of this uh, very important individual from my perspective as uh, a parapsychologist and, and someone who knew John Mack. Yeah, well, I'm, uh, you know, I, I relied on people like you, Jeff, who knew him best. Uh, I mean, he, he had died, which is how I got into the story. So I never met John Mack, but you did. And people like you who met him were able to, you know, communicate uh, things about his life that I couldn't find in his papers. I mean, the sense of immediacy uh, of him. But um, uh, he was uh, he was very driven by this idea of the inner life versus the outer life. And he subjected himself to a lot of analysis, trying to understand his own motives. He got captivated by the alien abduction story. It, it, it's sort of a an archetypal story, but it, it got him into a lot of trouble, ultimately. Uh, it got him into trouble at Harvard. It did, um, because, I mean, Harvard, as I say in my book, uh, was no stranger to uh, anomalous research. I mean, William James, the father of psychology and, and um, uh, you know, a revered figure at Harvard had experimented with seances and he had gotten involved in all kinds of strange anomalous events um, and, and Harvard somehow survived. <laughs> um, but when John Mack got into that, suddenly uh, Harvard recoiled and um, part of it had to do with John Mack's own particular enthusiasms, which he himself acknowledged sometimes got in the way. Um, his um, his approach to things uh, sort of turned off uh, some of the more conventional members of the you know the Harvard establishment. Um, so uh, so so that was an issue. 
but um, uh, it didn't seem to bother him much. I mean, he one of the first things he did when he learned about it is he lectured to a Harvard audience. Of course, he wrote the book, Abductions, which made it very public where he stood on the question of alien abductions. In that sense, uh, he showed none of the reserve and tact that uh, William James demonstrated uh, in investigating seances. Well, that's true. And, you know, people have asked, well, why didn't he publish first in a peer journal, peer reviewed journal? And in fact, he tried. He submitted an article to a, a very highly respected psychology journal. The editor was interested in his article in the beginning. And when John Mack turned it in, it was a hundred pages. And the editor said, I can't run a hundred page article in the journal. Uh, our articles run about 3,500 words. So uh, do me a favor, cut it down and include some more information. So that's a typical editor's trick, you know, cut it down and add information. So John looked, you know, looked it over and said, there's no way I could, uh, I needed a full hundred pages to describe this extremely complicated phenomenon to begin with. So I can't really cut it down and I can't imagine what other information you want that I would include. So, um, he, so he was not able to publish in a peer journal. He tried that and other things. So finally he said, I'm going to go commercial and he got a, a really nice advance from uh, Scribner's and uh, the book was was a bestseller. And let's talk about the reasons why John Mack felt we had to take these alien abduction accounts at face value. Okay, that, that really is the core of, of my book, and it's at the center of, of the whole phenomenon. Um, I'll, I'll, let me set the, the, the groundwork a little bit. As John found out about it from uh, an artist named Bud Hopkins, who he'd been introduced to. And Bud Hopkins was an artist who got interested in UFOs and alien abduction, taught himself hypnosis, but he was no psychiatrist. So when he told John Mack about the phenomenon, these people coming forward with tales of being you know, beamed through walls and windows to spaceships for uh, uh, pseudo-medical experiments and reproductive procedures to breed a hybrid race. I mean, you know, amazing stories. Uh, first that John Mack was very skeptical of. Um, but uh, once he, he looked at the letters that people had sent um, Bud Hopkins, he realized this is something he couldn't walk away from. And he had a choice. I mean, he could do what a lot of other scientists do and say, this is too controversial. I'm not going to risk my career. Uh, on the contrary, he said, I'm going to plunge in. So um, he um, collected a circle of experiencers or abductees. Uh, uh, experiencers is a favorite term because it's less judgmental. And uh, plunged into their encounters in great depth, um, interviewing them both consciously and under hypnosis. And um, here's what um, really swayed him. Uh, first of all, the accounts were... Uh, basically consistent. Uh, they followed a certain pattern, people from all different walks of life, ages, even two, uh, children as young as two years old, you know, said, little man, fly me up in the sky. Uh, I go up in the sky. So they weren't reading books and seeing movies about UFOs. So th they were consistent, and yet they were different enough so they were not, uh, the people were not reading off a script. They were not following a, you know, a, a plot line that everybody agreed to pursue. Um, secondly, um, these people were not eager to have their stories told. They weren't coming forward for, to cash in for fame or fortune. They were very reluctant. They were ashamed, really, of what had happened to them. Um, there were certain physical marks on their bodies, scars, uh, after they remembered an abduction experience. Um, in one case, a paraplegic displayed these scars. So uh, John Mack said that he couldn't have self-inflicted these wounds. Um, the uh, There were sometimes areas outside the houses where people remembered seeing a UFO land, pre pre you know, preparatory or before their abduction experience. Um, and some of these areas showed evidence of a uh, heavy object landing, broken tree branches, pressed down grass. Um, and uh, so there were these fragmentary bits of evidence, never enough to convince people like the Harvard committee that ended up investigating him, but uh, certainly intriguing uh, aspects. And perhaps most of all, uh, when, when he uh, interviewed these people at great length, like a psychiatrist would, uh, he knew, first of all, uh, very quickly, that they were not insane. He knew what insanity was. Uh, 
Um, they were not deluded. They were not recounting a nightmare because he had written a book on nightmares. He was an expert in nightmares. Um, and, and perhaps most compellingly, uh, when they related these experiences to him, they relived them to the point of extreme emotional distress. They cried, they wept, they cursed. Um, and again, as a trained psychiatrist, he said, uh, I know what, you know, true affect looks like. And these people are not making it up. So that, you know, there's more to it. But I mean, that in a nutshell is what convinced him he was on the track of something. Now, he did have some allies, at, uh, the, both at Harvard University and in the Boston educational community. He wasn't doing this all on his own. No, not all on his own. He did have some um, supporters. Uh, first of all, there were other, uh, some other uh, psychiatrists who had seen some of these people. Uh, many of them had sent the patients or subjects, whatever you want to call them, away, saying, you've got to take medication or you are in more trouble than I can ever deal with. And I don't know what's going on with you, but I'm not going to deal with it. So that was a common um, reaction of many seconds, but, but some did, and, and, and uh, John was in touch with them. And uh, in some cases, they traded experiences. Now, they came sometimes away with rather different takes on it. Uh, John um, uh, found, for example, a great transformative aspect to these experiences. People, he said, often came away with greater uh, respect for the earth, uh, you know, greater uh, uh, conservational awareness, awareness of a deity or a source or a great divinity. Um, so their reactions weren't totally uh, negative uh, in terms of the trauma, which certainly existed, and he found that. But um, so he would trade these experiences off with... Um, so he would trade this experience off with other uh, with other psychiatrists. So yes, there was support, but there were also rivals who said uh, that they didn't support his methods at all, and that he was off on a wild goose chase, and et cetera, et cetera. There were also people in the physics community and in the astronomy community who took an interest in alien abductions. Well, absolutely right, and this is what's interesting. I start my book off with a story of a conference at MIT in 1992. Uh, MIT didn't sponsor the conference, but allowed uh, one of its halls to be used as a venue. Uh, and it was co-sponsored by John Mack and an uh, atomic physicist at MIT named Dave Pritchard, who was intrigued by this whole idea of alien, alien abduction. Um, so, uh, and this conference, which was a secret conference at the time, they, they were no one, everyone was sworn to secrecy because it was so controversial. Um, but for a week, uh, atomic physicists, um, psychiatrists, psychologists, theologians, folklorists, uh, people from many different disciplines gathered at MIT to examine this very strange phenomenon from every different possible aspect to try to figure out what the hell it was. And um, in the end, they produced a thick volume, a transcript of the proceedings, which, by the way, I urge every so-called skeptic and, and debunker to read before they dismiss this whole phenomenon as crazy or impossible. Of course, it's impossible. <laughs> Everyone knows it's impossible. And yet, as I say in my, the epigram for my book, I never said it was possible. I only said it was true. So they all agreed it was impossible, and yet they were uh, they were all captivated, like Mac and like me later, uh, with the 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 urgent questions of this mystery. So um, it, it drew many uh, uh, you know professional people. Now that's very interesting. The uh, quote in your epigraph it comes from Sir William Crookes, who was a, a great scientist, a physicist in the nineteenth century. A uh, contemporary of William James, for example, and it referred in his case to the investigation of mediums and seances, materializations and apports, and actually there, there's quite an overlap between uh, this sort of phenomenon and uh, the UFO abductions. Uh, absolutely. I mean, Crooks uh, was sent, uh, uh, as a respected scientist, he was sent out to debunk uh, 
these uh, uh, seances and, you know, paranormal experiences. So he, he went to one of these seances. He watched people levitate. He watched musical instruments play themselves in the cabinet. Um, he, he saw all these, uh, you know, uh, protoplasm materialize. And instead of debunking it, as he'd been sent to do, he came back and he said, uh, I, I never said it was possible. I only said it was true. He believed what he had seen. And that's what made it so strange. And he was a very good... Uh, observer and, uh, and and John Mack was uh, you know in the in the same vein I think. Well, when I met John Mack, uh, who incidentally wrote the foreword to my book, The PK Man, he uh, had already sort of transformed his point of view. By, by the time I knew him, he was uh, acknowledging that the phenomena associated with shamanism, for example, were of uh, the same ilk as the UFO abductions, a phenomenon that we find in, in folklore, that, that UFO abductions were part of a wide spectrum of phenomena that have been reported uh, for centuries. Absolutely, Jeff. That, that's a very, very good point. That um, I think in the beginning, John saw abduction as something uh, apart, singular and apart. Uh, he was so bowled over by the stories he had gotten from Bud Hopkins that um, he naturally focused on them, and, he, and them really to the exclusion of other paranormal things. Uh, later, uh, he, he extended his range, and he thought that uh, perhaps they were related in some way, and that they were all part of a larger uh, picture um, of, of mysteries that, you know, people like Charles Fort, the great anomalist, uh, said uh, um, it's like looking for a needle no one ever lost in a haystack that never was. <laughs> uh, so John realized that it was really only part of a much broader picture of mysteries, including crop circles and cattle mutilations and, and Bigfoot and Irish fairy stories. And all these things sort of came up um, to the same conclusion that people had seen these things, they reported on these things, and there was no evidence uh, that anyone could could bring forward that would convince, you know, uh, skeptics because evidence was very elusive. And yet uh, the stories were very compelling being told by, all, you know, all, a great cross section of humanity. But uh, as you point out, they really um, are related um, to many other things, including ultimately, you know, death itself, uh, which was John Mack's last crusade. Let's talk about the investigation that took place at, at Harvard. Now, William James explored seances. He, even before his death, came out and, and said that he believed that uh, his colleague, uh, Richard Hodgson, had uh, manifested in, in spirit form. And if it wasn't Richard Hodgson, it would have been some kind of demonic entity who, who was imitating Hodgson. Uh, but William James was never investigated by Harvard the way John Mack was. Well, William James never went on Oprah. <laughs> Although may, maybe had Oprah been around, then he, he probably would have gone. He was a pretty uh, he was a pretty adventurous type. Um, but uh, seriously, um, certain things John did that rubbed people at Harvard the wrong way. First of all, he wrote a bestseller. <laughs> um, he he was a very uh, intelligent. We should have started off by saying that. I mean, he was extremely uh, handsome. He was tall, commanding, with blue eyes. He was magnetic uh, to men and women. He gathered people around him very quickly. He was a brilliant talker um, and a very uh, good writer and lecturer. So um, he he would you know he was the kind of person who would stand out and would make himself a target at a place like Harvard, where uh, perhaps um, others were not so, you know, for, uh, outgoing and, and charismatic. Um, in academia, you know, the worst thing you can do is be successful more than your colleagues. Uh, you know, I mean, let's face it, there's a lot of professional jealousy. So that was one thing. He wrote, he, he won a Pulitzer Prize with the um, T.E. Lawrence book. Um, and uh, And he also had a uh, um, charming to some, uh, disconcerting to others way of, of, of being naive. Um, uh, he didn't seem to care much about uh, the effect his, his words or actions would have. He just plowed ahead. And, uh, and that, uh, you know, sort of uh, rubbed people the wrong way at Harvard. Uh, he wasn't terribly careful. 
Um, and he was very enthusiastic. I mean, the, one of the subtitles of my book is The Passion of John Mack. And I wasn't meaning to suggest necessarily that he was a, rigid, a religious figure who was crucified, but um, maybe close at times at Harvard. But the idea was the passion. Uh, and that didn't sit well with some of his, you know, more staid colleagues who, you know, um, just, uh, you know, shrank from the kind of publicity he was doing on TV shows and, uh, you know, New York Times articles, op-ed pieces, etc. So all that came together. That was a factor. To my knowledge, Harvard does not investigate its faculty members routinely. Uh, the committee that was set up to look at John Mack's work with alien abductions was very unusual, as far as I know. It was indeed, and um, I call it at times an inquisition. Um, and it was a word that the head of the committee, Arnold Relman, a very prominent um, uh, physician and um, uh, editor of the New England Journal of Medicine at one point and, uh, and someone who had tangled with John Mack in, in the past. Um, he, wa- he told John at one of the first meetings of this committee, he said, this is not an inquisition. <laughs> so John, being a good psychiatrist, wondered, well, why would they use the word <laughs> for what it was not? <laughs> if it was not, a- so it really was a kind of an inquisition. It was secret. Um, it brought in, um, it, w- it in many ways, it was, uh, convened to discredit him. They looked into his financial practices. They spoke to a lot of people who were sworn enemies of him because he had tangled with them on different uh, cases. Um, so um, uh, it was unusual at Harvard. And again, as I said, it was supposed to be secret. A little bit of it leaked out, but I'm the only one who has the whole story of the of the Harvard committee in my book because uh, they never issued a report afterwards. It only came out, I have it from uh, legal memos, uh, from emails back and forth. Uh, so little bits and pieces of it came out. Actually, there were some leaks from Harvard, it looked like, um, to put them in a better light. But uh, the whole story of the, um, uh, the inquiry has never come out, but I have it in my book. Well, it seemed as if at, at that time in history, the very idea that you would take a story about an alien abduction at face value meant that your credibility as a serious scholar uh, must be called into question. Well, it was a hard sell <laughs> at Harvard. I mean, uh, you know, even given William James's, you know, experimental uh, psychology a century earlier, um, and even given uh, a lot of the cutting edge research that was going on at Harvard, uh, th- this was a toughie. <laughs> I mean, it's hard. Um, it's a tough sell, uh, not at Harvard. I mean, in, in the world, uh, these stories of alien abduction are, are very strange. Uh, they're very controversial because they can't be proven. Um, they're the st- a staple of, of, the, of uh, entertainment, of course. They're all over movies and books and stories. But um, for uh, an academic institution dedicated to uh, you know, getting at the, the, the truth of things, it, it's, a, it's a very difficult thing to wrap your mind around. Um, uh, but on the other hand, uh, John was courageous enough to pursue something um, that was very hard to prove, impossible to prove, in fact. Uh, and yet there was enough uh, anecdotal evidence, as he said. I mean, he was only following the kind of anecdotal evidence that comes up in court all the time and gets people convicted and sentenced to death. That's anecdotal evidence uh, in, in some cases. So, uh, but admittedly, it, it was it was a, it was a, a tough uh, fit for Harvard. Well, Ralph, you ha- are, I think of you as sort of a hard-boiled reporter. You've covered all sorts of crime stories and terrorist stories and uh, big news stories in, in your life. This is a little bit uh, outside of the, the realm of stories that you've covered throughout your long career in journalism. How do you evaluate it today? Well, I, w- I would say it's not only a little bit outside what I had done <laughs> my whole career at the Times. I had written about Nazi war criminals and the mafia and, you know, um, uh, corrupt politicians and cops. And uh, so it, it was a departure for me. Um, but um, I must say, I've always had a kind of a spiritual side to me. I mean, I always uh, felt the, the presence of, you know, more to the world than you can immediately see taste and touch I, I'm not I mean I'm not really that comfortable talking about my own uh, 
beliefs and, and views, but I'll, I'll say that uh, I'm not conventionally uh, religious, brought up Jewish, but not um, a um, you know follower of all the rituals. And yet I've always felt that there's something um, uh, spiritual uh, outside you know our material world. So uh, that wasn't that hard for me to accept. My mind was blown by the stories I read too uh, that John Mack uh, uh, introduced me to. You could say in his um, you know, research. Uh, and, and I talked to a lot of these experiences myself. I interviewed them myself. And, um, I came away the way John Mack did, although he had, you know, much, he was much better equipped to evaluate their stories as a psych- psychiatrist. I just had my reporter's instinct. But, um, I was also convinced that they were not, you know, lying to me. They were not mentally ill. Uh, they were, not eager to tell their stories, they were shy about their stories, and yet something something very real had happened to them. And uh, I don't solve the mystery in my book, Jeff, as, as you know. I don't I don't know anybody who has. Um, but I, what I like to say is I I think I know what it's not. I mean, it's not mental illness. Uh, it's not you know group delusion and group insanity. It's not. A fabrication by and large some cases have been fabricated there have been some hoaxes but the phenomenon itself is not based on uh, on that so um, uh, I was captivated the way John Mack was captivated you do talk about a fascinating instance a woman named Donna Bassett as I recall who actually uh, went public and said she hoaxed John Mack Yeah, I mean, I said John was naive at times, and he was very enthusiastic. I mean, he was the kind of guy who, in a newspaper interview, would ask the the interviewer, um, you think I should say anything about drug use, or uh, how about, um, uh, yeah, he'd bring up a lot of controversial things and ask the opinion of of, of the reporter. You know, whether he should talk about this and his John's publicity people sometimes sitting in would shrink and say, oh, my God, you know, don't, no, that that's off the record. Don't talk about that. So um, anyway, um, um, so he was, uh, you know, he was he was naive and he um, and he got himself into trouble that way. So John was open to a lot of strange stories. Um, I mean, all these stories are strange. There's not one story that's not strange. I mean, they're all strange in different ways. Some are even stranger, much stranger than other stories. So this woman came forward to John and said she had been abducted and, uh, she had been on a spaceship during the Cuban missile, during the Cuban missile crisis with the Soviet premier uh, Khrushchev and, and uh, JFK, President Kennedy. And, um, uh, Khrushchev sat in her lap weeping and so you know a- after the crazy stories John had heard this didn't seem all that crazy <laughs> you laugh about it now but anyway he he was very intrigued by her story and uh, afterwards she said she'd made it all up she told Time magazine she was out to uh, expose John Mack as a fraud and the Time magazine reporter and I tell the whole story in my book was a kind of geared toward exposing John Mack himself, uh, thought that he was somehow, um, uh, you know, worthy of, of exposure, that he was doing uh, things that were not right, and told the story in his Time magazine uh, article that came out around the time of the publication of John's book, um, and including the Donna Bassett story, where she said she'd hoaxed him. Well, John came back later and and said and showed some evidence that she told similar stories before that to other, um, uh, you know, uh, in, investor UFO and, and abduction investigators like Whitley Strieber. And it wasn't so far fetched that she might indeed have, be, have really been an experiencer herself and for some reason targeted John Mack. So it was a very tangled affair. But uh, Bud Hopkins, who was John's f- close friend and collaborator times blame John for for being too naive and 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 basically uh, hurting the whole cause by buying the story in the first place so uh, it was a it was a big black mark and uh, um, it didn't mean all the stories that John got were hoaxes but this one um, became known as as a, as a kind of a hoax story even though it may not have been a hoax um, and uh, and that hurt him 
Now, uh, another academic who took a very serious interest in UFO abductions was David Jacobs, uh, who uh, in in many ways was a compatriot and uh, I suppose a colleague in spirit with John Mack. Uh, in, in fact, I think he even went further than John Mack and, and endorsed the idea of an alien hybrid breeding program. Yeah. uh, I mean, if you think of this as a kind of a spectrum of there were three people who were uh, collaborators in many ways um, and friends, uh, yet took rather different views of the whole phenomenon. John Mack was on one end, who increasingly began to think that there was something spiritual about this whole thing, that it wasn't really happening in, in real time, um, that it was some penetration of our world from another dimension. So he was open to the idea that uh, this was not uh, totally re- in reality. Then in the middle was Bud Hopkins, who believed it was happening uh, in, in our reality and that the aliens were out to uh, steal our DNA, in effect, uh, for a hybrid race. And then at the end of the spectrum was Dave Jacobs, who, who was a professor at Temple, who had done a groundbreaking book on the history of UFOs, a really great work of scholarship, and became interested himself and taught himself hypnosis and gathered his own circle of uh, experiencers. And he took perhaps uh, the more extreme uh, view that the aliens were undeniably evil, that they're walking among us as, as hybrids, um, that they are abducting people to, to steal their DNA, eggs from women and sperm from men to create this hybrid race, and um, that it's absolutely happening uh, really in real time. And uh, so it was a kind of a spectrum with Hopkins more in the middle and John at, 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 the, at the more spiritual end. But um, the three of them, you know, examining the same uh, stories came to very different conclusions. You also talk about uh, David Hufford, I believe is, is his name, who uh, was a specialist in the phenomenon of sleep paralysis and how that might be one way of accounting, at least for some of the abduction uh, stories. Yeah, David Hufford, who I interviewed for my book and who's a great scholar, and uh, he wrote a book on the, the called The Terror That Comes in the Night, um, a book about the so-called old hag syndrome. He found that people, particularly in Newfoundland, uh, told stories of being accosted in their beds at night by a strange evil presence that climbed up on their chest and strangled them, uh, literally, almost into unconsciousness. A uh, very evil, foul-smelling presence that had that sensory dimension that was really uh, creepy. Um, and it happened to David Hufford, too, by his own account. He was a student um, in college when he felt, you know, the door open, this being climb onto his bed and try to strangle him. So he knew, you know, the phenomenon firsthand, you could say. So um, that was another example of, um, you know, paranormal phenomena. It was not alien reduction. These people were not taken up to a spaceship, but it was some kind of a presence that uh, confronted them at night, usually in their beds. Now, uh, John Mack countered that uh, the abductions didn't always happen in, from the beds at night. Sometimes people would be driving a car or they'd be walking in the street or all kinds of things. So he... Uh, um, challenged the conventional explanation, including David Hufford's view that it was some kind of sleep paralysis thing because it didn't, it didn't always happen during sleep. So, um, but Hufford was, became an admirer of John Max and he, um, uh, he thought Mac was really onto something. He just thought Mac was focusing too much on just abduction to the exclusion of other paranormal things. And as I recall, David Hufford also uh, understood the limitations of hypnotic regression as a way of getting at at the truth. Uh, it's become very controversial in many areas, the use of hip- hypnotic regression in, in psychotherapy, and that controversy overlapped all the work that uh, John was doing. Yes, uh, indeed, and it, it really brings up the whole question of memory. You know, how strong and secure is memory? And there was just an article in the New Yorker two weeks ago about Elizabeth Loftus, who was the, the you know prime um, proponent of the fact that uh, you know we can't trust our memories. And John came down on the side. Well, when it comes to alien abduction, we can. 
He said, when it's so central to your being, those memories are strongly imprinted. They're not something that can be implanted by hypnosis. But there are many, um, and the con- as you say, the controversy continues to this day, whether um, the, the uh, subjects are influenced, influenceable to the point where they abdo- adopt um, a, a, a narrative of the uh, psychotherapist or the hypnotist who, you know, um, implants these ideas. Uh, John was very much against that. He said, no, these things are so central to what happened to this person that uh, there is no way uh, they could be mistaken about this. Um, but it is also true, and this gets into a subtlety that's really kind of fascinating, that um, it, it has been observed that patients seem to gravitate toward different psychotherapists um, studying uh, alien abduction, depending on what the patient or the, or the subject uh, kind of wanted to have out of it. If it was a positive experience, they'd find their way to John Mack. If it was a nightmarish, traumatic, horrible experience, they'd find their way to Bud Hopkins or David Jacobs. Now, I, that's oversimplifying things. But um, it, it had been commented on by, by a number of observers that um, you know, uh, who you got as a hypnotist or, or who you got as a therapist could kind have of affected the story that came out. Elizabeth Loftus, who you mentioned earlier, achieved a lot of notoriety with regard to cases that somehow parallel the alien abduction story. These are cases of uh, uh, ostensible satanic abuse, ritual satanic abuse. And and, and she argued that uh, the, the reports of these stories under hypnosis could not be relied upon. Yeah, that's for sure. I spent some time in my book uh, recreating some of these cases, the McMartin School case where uh, children told sto- stories of horrendous satanic abuse. You know, an elephant came into the classroom and they dismembered it and, you know, all kinds of things that uh, somehow were accepted as real at the time. Uh, accurate accounts from the students and people were fired and it was a huge scandal. Uh, at the school, and there were two people I talk about in my book who were convicted of, of uh, murdering um, little girls because their uh, their daughters uh, and family members later came forward with these supposedly repressed memories that they had seen this, and without any evidence that the um, that, that, that the uh, defendant had actually committed the crime, but just on the evidence of the family member testifying, I just had this memory. I now remember how he killed my my little friend. Uh, these two two men in particular were convicted, and then the cases were later questioned or reversed. Um, and again, it served to discredit memory as a sound foundation for traumatic events. Um, but John said uh, alien abduction was different. First of all, it, it wasn't um, a matter of murder or rape. Um, uh, these were cases that were infused with also kind of a spiritual dimension. They weren't totally traumatic. Uh, and secondly, um, he just didn't think that the, the kinds of uh, affect that accompanied the reliving of these experiences could, could lead you to conclude that they were in any way not authentic. One of the uh, people who you report as being associated with John Mack, at least uh, occasionally and at conferences, someone I've interviewed several times, Whitley Strieber, who achieved uh, enormous uh, fame for uh, his story of uh, an alien encounter. Yeah, he was one of the first with his book Communion, which was a tremendous eye-opener. I mean, people said later that just seeing uh, that book cover of uh, the alien face with the big elongated eyes uh, sent them into, you know, a traumatic shock because it, it, it uh, stirred memories uh, of, uh, you know, uh, abductions that they had put, basically buried. Um, but the interesting thing about Whitley Strieber's story is that it didn't fit, in, in many ways, it didn't fit the so-called core abduction narrative. Uh, he had really strange experiences, which he tells very well, 
in his many books. Um, but they were not simple abduction stories. They were encounters with very strange beings, and uh, they weren't all taking him up to a ship. Um, and this brings up a very interesting question of the stories that don't fit the narrative. Um, and the uh, tendency of many researchers, including John Mack, I think at times, was to push aside the things that don't fit and focus on the things that do fit, because it's too hard to explain the things that don't fit. And yet there were some very good people I talked to who I cite in my book who say, no, the uh, the things that don't fit are exactly what should be studied, particularly, and the people who don't get abducted should be studied, because it helps explain why some people are and some people aren't abducted or, or have these abduction experiences. Um, but the, the tendency of, of many researchers is to, uh, is to uh, turn away or rule out the things that don't fit. And Whitley's experiences are so strange that um, they don't fit uh, in many ways the core narrative. And yet uh, they are as, uh, as compelling and to him and uh, people who've you know, looked into his cases as, as real as the other cases. One of the very strange phenomena reported by Whitley that doesn't fit, but which is related to the John Mack story, is that Whitley reports that on, on the occasion when he had a sexual experience with what he took to be an alien entity, the one, I think, whose picture is on the cover of Communion, uh, there were other people in the room, including people who were deceased. Yeah, the, the um, Whitley was a great uh, proponent of the idea that death and abduction are related in some way, and that um, often uh, during abductions, uh, people see other people who who are deceased, and that they reappear during abductions. Um, and you know, as long as you're mentioning Whitley and strange experiences, he tells this story, which is really uh, indelible to me. Um, uh, he, when he met one of these beings, when, when he was abducted, basically, or, or forced to, you know, to, uh, uh comply with, uh, he was paralyzed, he couldn't, he couldn't move, um, this being, uh, he said it, it came into his mind, and often the beings communicate, as the people say later, by telepathy. It's not like they speak good English, but the words just pop into the, into human minds of what these beings are communicating. So he got the idea that this being that had, uh, you know, uh, trapped him or whatever was going to put some kind of an implant in his brain. And it filled him with complete terror. And then he said, uh, this woman, uh, creature being said to him, um, uh, the word popped into his mind, what can we do to make you stop screaming? And he said, I, the, I said the first thing that came to mind, I said, uh, you could let me smell you. And she, because it was a female uh, entity, put out her arm and he smelled it. And he said, it smelled like damp cardboard. And somehow that calmed me down. And years later, he smelled that smell again. And like, you know, like a Proust Madeline, it took him back to his abduction experience. Now, again, you know, who could make something like that up? It's just so crazy. But one more thing with Whitley, uh, just unleashed a flood of memories here. Um, uh, he talks very movingly about being subject to to kind of anal rape by one of these uh, robotic devices that the beings had that they inserted into his anus. And he said it was a huge thing. And that's why it seemed so unlikely it could even enter his body. And afterwards, he felt raped and he was very angry about it. And I, I tell you, I came across another account quite separately in another book, and I, I forgot exactly where, of a completely other person abductee describing a very similar machine and the same process. I said, oh, my God, what are the likelihood that somebody would, would come up with an exact same story, the same kind of device, uh, put in the same place with the same, you know, horrible effect? Um, anyway... <laughs> Don't get me started. <laughs> well, when I spoke to Whitley not long ago, he, he explained to me he still takes medication for the wound that occurred decades ago when that uh, supposed anal rape occurred. Uh, 
it, it makes one wonder why he calls it communion and not rape. But um, in, in, in <laughs> any case, the same. <laughs> yeah. Uh, let's now talk about John Mack's final interest, which was uh, looking at uh, the question of survival after death, and and in particular the survival of uh, Elizabeth Targ, who had been a friend of mine. Yeah. Um, so as I said, John, you know, went through a series of pr progressions from first his social causes and then his interest in Lawrence. And, uh, we, we skipped over the part where he studied holotropic breathing, which is a way of, uh, raising, uh, you know, entering different levels of consciousness without drugs, which he'd also tried, uh, but through, through breathing discipline. But anyway, and then he discovered alien abduction and then he started looking at other experiences like crop circles and he went to England to investigate that. And at the very end of his life, he was uh, interested, particularly interested, he became more and more interested in survival of consciousness, what happens after death. Um, and he, uh, he befriended this brilliant young woman, uh, Elizabeth Targ, who was a psychiatrist, studying, uh, among other things, the powers of distant healing on an AIDS population. And she found, by the way, that uh, it had an effect, that people who were prayed for uh, did better than the people uh, who weren't prayed for. Um, and she died of a brain cancer, uh, geoblastoma, that uh, she was studying herself and, and other people. So it was very tragic. And um, uh, John had befriended her when she was alive, and after she died, uh, a friend said she began to appear. Came, signals came from her, lights would flicker, and people got messages from her, including her husband, got messages in Russian, which they both spoke. Um, so John was pursuing a book on the topic, and he had sent a treatment to his agent um, and was in the process of trying to sell the book on, on Elizabeth and interviewed uh, her and uh, he had interviewed her when she was alive and then all her friends afterwards. Um, and uh, as things would develop, uh, after he was killed by that uh, car um, in London in 2004, um, friends of his told me that they uh, experienced his spirit after he had died. And I put that at the end of the book, and I said, I don't want to invest it with the same credibility that other things in the book are, because I think other things in the book are, are better sourced, um, uh, you know. But these are pure anecdotal accounts of people who said that they experienced John in some spiritual form, but they were very detailed and very compelling accounts. Um, and uh, uh, I wouldn't leave them out of the book because um, they were so moving to me. Um, and, um, it, it looked as though actually he was preparing in some ways for death because he would tell people at the end of his life, uh, I think I could do better work from the other side, uh, and things like that. And they would shrink and say, Oh, John, don't talk that way. But, um, uh, you know, like Lauren, he, he patterned himself after Lawrence in some ways. And Lawrence, he thought, he said that Lawrence's death was an accident, but not entirely accidental. And uh, I think the same thing could be said of, of his death, that uh, it was an accident. It was not a conspiracy. I checked out the police reports. It was not a hit. Um, uh, and yet he was tired. Uh, he, uh, he was dispirited in many ways. He felt he had done the bulk of his work. Uh, um, so perhaps he was looking forward to the next chapter. As I recall from an earlier conversation you and I had, uh, at, at one point it, it was as if he specifically predicted his own death right before he left for London where he was killed. Yes, um, I got it. Unfortunately, the, this account I got, uh, I got from somebody uh, very close to John uh, who talked to him just as he was leaving for London and she said to him, where are you going? And he made a motion like this down <laughs> to the earth. <laughs> and it didn't, uh, you know, uh, occur to her till afterwards, till he had died. But um, other people said the same thing. He, he played a game. He liked to fool around with runes, you know, these Viking stones that spoke, predict the future. If you look at the the, the side that, you know, the, the symbol uh, imprinted on the, on the rune, on the stone, and then you consult a book that's a guide. It'll tell you, answer a question that you have. 
and he played that game. If not, it's more than a game. He he went through the ritual with his colleagues just before he left for London. And he reached into the bag and he pulled out a rune, and it was the blank, uh, which some said you know foretells death, and uh, people were a bit shocked by it, and uh, you know he made light of it. But um, so anyway, there were these uh, for for foretellings, you might say, foreshadowings. One of the people you write about who uh, felt they had been in contact with John after his death reported that uh, he he told them, uh, "I didn't think it would be this easy." Yeah, that was a say on at, uh, after uh, Veronica Keene, who was a, a great. Uh, a student of afterlife experience with her husband, Monty Keene, in, in England. She sat with the body, and um, she she recalled hearing that. Um, he said, I looked down at my body, and it was all broken after the accident, and I had to decide whether to go or to stay, and I decided to go. Um, that was the message she got. Um, there was another woman... Barbara Lamb, who was a fellow psychiatrist who had gone with John to the uh, crop circles, um, who told me she was visiting her daughter in California after John died, and the daughter had a cat, and Barbara was allergic, and she couldn't breathe, so she went out on the patio to get fresh air and try to sleep there, and suddenly she felt she was choking to death. And then she became aware of a figure of John standing there, and a, a ball of light uh, flew over to uh, landed on her chest and and suddenly she could breathe again and John said you'll be all right Barbara um, again <laughs> you know did she have any proof <laughs> uh, no proof but it's her story and there were other stories like that Ralph at this point now John has been gone for uh, 16 17 years uh, how do you evaluate his legacy well, it's very difficult. I don't think anyone has come to replace him, partly because he was in so many ways irreplaceable. I mean, he was such a charismatic, brave uh, presence who would, uh, you know, buck the establishment at Harvard. Um, and as Avi Loeb says in his new book, uh, Extraterrestrial at Harvard, he's a astrophysicist at Harvard, crossed paths with John Mack. Uh, he says in his new book that scientists are very uh, risk averse. They'd rather chase something that other people are chasing uh, rather than go off in a new direction. So I don't see um, anybody coming along with John's, you know, charisma and, and profile. On the other hand, this research is continuing. I mean, it's not dead. It's going on. I don't know too much about where it's going on, but experiences are meeting. Um, they're telling their stories. Um, it's happening. It hasn't gone away. Uh Certainly the, you know, the UFO sightings are now more uh, credible than ever before with the Navy and the Pentagon, you know, backing up the, the incidents and saying these things are real. Uh, they're not, you know, spiritual constructs. They're not imaginings. They are physically real. They show up on radar. They show up on thermal imaging devices. So, so that's progress. So that, you know, you could say is part of his legacy. Um, and I'm hoping that my book too will 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 show him as a um, as a credible um, you know resource and uh, will stimulate other research. Well, I have to say I think he was ahead of his time, and uh, I regard John Mack as a as a real hero. And I'm very grateful to you, Ralph, for having written such a thorough, comprehensive biography of him. I know we have just really skimmed the surface of all the many details that you cover. So, Ralph Blumenthal, thank you so much for being with me today. Well, it's a real pleasure, Jeff. Thank you. And for those of you watching or listening, thank you for being with us. Music